I'm Ann Carmichael with Leela, Louisiana's nonprofit resource for FAFSA completion and college access. And I'm going to be presenting on the college financial aid process. Because college can be expensive, it is time to start preparing for those costs, which are going to include equipment, books, and supplies, personal expenses, room and board, and tuition and fees. Most often when you're doing your college search, you will see listed on their websites the um, cost of tuition. And it's just good to know that there are some additional items included in the entire cost of attendance. But the good news is that financial aid is available from the US Department of Education, the state of Louisiana, your college or career school, and then nonprofit and private organizations like Leela. Now there are three types of student financial aid. There's free money, borrowed money, and earned money. Types of federal student aid include the federal Pell Grant, the federal Supplemental Education Opportunity Grant, the Teacher Educational Assistance for College and Higher Education Grant, the Iraq and Afghanistan Service Grant, Federal Work Study, and direct subsidized, unsubsidized, and PLUS loans. The federal grant family includes Pell Grants for undergraduates with financial need, FSEOGs for undergraduates with exceptional financial need, service grants for students of military parents who died defending the country following 9-11, and TEACH grants for students pursuing a teaching career. The federal work study program provides part-time jobs to help the student pay for his education expenses. So when you answer yes on the FAFSA to federal work study, the financial aid office will consider you for available jobs on their campus. Any earnings that you make from those jobs should be used to pay your college expenses. Now these jobs look great on your first professional resume. So if you're going to a four-year college and you accept a federal work study job, say it's in the financial aid office, that's four years of professional work study to report on that resume. Now, no one wants to have to borrow, but if you can't complete your college degree without student loans, they are a good investment. It's just important to remember to only borrow what you need to complete your education. And it's important to understand the different types of loans that you might be offered. Direct subsidized loans are based on financial need and no interest is charged until you graduate or cease to attend. These are unknown as need-based loans. On the other hand, almost everyone is eligible for direct unsubsidized loans, regardless of financial need. However, the interest begins to accrue on these loans once they're fully dispersed and then throughout the life of the loan. So you can see there is a big difference between direct subsidized and unsubsidized loans. When you receive your student financial aid offer, always accept the subsidized loans first. And you can remember this by telling yourself that the U and unsubsidized means that you always pay the interest on this loan. If you do make the decision to accept loans, you always want to accept the federal student loans first because payments aren't due until you graduate or cease to attend. The interest rate is fixed at a lower rate and no credit check is required. These loans are in the student's name only. With the private loans, some lenders are going to ask that you begin making payments while you're still in school 
the interest rate might be variable and often it's much higher and they almost always require a cosigner. Students and families, make sure that you're doing your research before selecting a private loan lender. Student financial aid can be used at four-year public and private colleges, community colleges, career and technical schools, or part-time classes, and then to take online courses as well. All federal student aid and most institutional and private aid is contingent upon completion of the free application for federal student aid or the FAFSA, which launches on October 1st of every year. Student financial aid is awarded on a first come first served basis. So you want to submit your FAFSA as soon as possible. And remember to pay close attention to and meet all of the FAFSA deadlines set forth by your colleges, state government, federal student aid, and check with your high school counselor. She might have a FAFSA deadline to meet your graduation requirement. Now to be eligible for federal student aid, the student must be one of the following. A US citizen or US national, have a green card or have an arrival departure record or a battered immigrant status or have a T visa. If his parents do not fall within one of these categories, a dependent student can still complete and submit the FAFSA, but they will enter zeros anywhere a parent social security number is requested. Remember that only those with a valid social security card can create an FSA ID and electronically sign the FAFSA. All others should print a signature page, sign and mail to the address provided. You want to begin the FAFSA process by collecting all of the documents needed to complete this form. And by doing so, it should take no longer than 30 to 45 minutes to complete and submit your FAFSA. Those documents include the student and parents social security cards because you must report your name and number exactly as printed on your most recent card. The student and parents 2020 federal income tax returns if you filed one. Now, if you don't have a copy of this return, now is a good time to contact your tax preparer for a duplicate copy. You'll need the student and parents 2020 W-2s because there's information on this form that might not be found on your federal tax return. And then bank statements and records of investments because you must report the balances of these accounts as of the date you submit the FAFSA. You'll want to begin the process by creating your federal student aid ID. This is going to allow the student and parents to identify themselves electronically when accessing federal student aid websites, such as the FAFSA. The FSA ID will consist of a username and a password that each of you create and should only reflect your personal information. Each student and one of his parents should provide his or her personal information to create an FSA ID. Remember, don't share information. Students don't use your parents' mobile phone as your alternate phone in your ID and vice versa. Also, don't use your school email address because you may no longer have access to that um, email once you graduate. Your FSA ID is your official electronic signature and it's legally binding. So make sure that you're recording it because you're gonna need it every year that you're in college, but that you keep it in a safe place and don't share it. If you don't have access to a computer when you're ready to get started, you can always download the FAFSA mobile app. It's called My Student Aid and it's easy to use to submit your FAFSA on your mobile phone or any mobile device with internet access. 
or you can complete the FAFSA using the web-based version at fafsa.gov. Now, if the student prefers the web-based the web -based version and the parents prefer to use the mobile app, that's fine. You can each work independently and all the information is going to be integrated into one form when it's time to sign and submit. Begin the FAFSA uh, by logging in with the student's FSA ID because the FAFSA is the student's application for federal student aid. The parent FSA ID will be used later in the process to transfer tax information um, from the IRS into the FAFSA and then again to sign the student's FAFSA. The high school class of 2022 should complete the 2022-2023 FAFSA because that's the academic year that you're applying for financial aid. If you select the 21-22 FAFSA, you're going to be considered for financial aid for this academic year. Now, Louisiana public school seniors must complete the 2022-23 FAFSA to meet your graduation requirements. There are seven sections that need to be completed before submitting your FAFSA and the information that you use to create your student and parents FSA IDs must match exactly um, what you've entered into the FAFSA. If not, you're going to have trouble signing and submitting your FAFSA. This means that the name, social security number, date of birth, email address, phone number, must be exactly as you entered in the FSA ID. The sections include the student demographics, where the student will be asked to report his social security number, name, date of birth, email address, home address, residency status, and gender. The school selection section, where you will be asked to report the name of your high school, the colleges that you want your FAFSA data to be sent to, and your housing plans on each of those campuses. The dependency status section, where the student will be asked to consider a list of questions to determine whether he is a dependent or an independent student for FAFSA purposes. He'll be asked to report the number of dependents living in his household and his parents' education completion level to determine whether he is a first generation college student. You'll then move to the parent demographic section where parents will provide their social security numbers, their names, their marital status, um, and email addresses. And then you'll move on to the parent and student financial section where each of you will be asked to report your working wages from 2020, any federal benefits that you receive, and your savings and investment account balances. And then it's almost time to sign and submit, but first review your FAFSA summary page. This page is going to reflect every question that you've been asked within the FAFSA, and your answer to it. And this is your chance to review the information and then go back and make any changes that you see necessary. It also ensures that the financial aid office receives accurate information so they can um, process your financial aid timely. Next, it's going to be time to sign and submit your FAFSA. Um, you'll see that one parent and the student must sign the FAFSA before it's submitted. Um, if you submit your FAFSA without your signatures, it's going to be marked incomplete and you're going to eventually have to go back in and sign. If you have two parents listed on the FAFSA, the one who created the FSA ID, of course, is the one who needs to sign. Now, as you're moving through the FAFSA, you're gonna see a question mark beside each question. If you want um, a more detailed description, click on that question mark or 
click on the hyperlinks that are provided that might give you an idea of some legal and financial aid terms that you may not have heard of before. You can call Federal Student Aid for help, or you can contact me on Leela's FAFSA helpline, and I'll provide that information to you toward the end of the presentation. Only the colleges that you list on the FAFSA in the school selection section are going to consider you for student financial aid. So add all of the schools that you're considering, even if you haven't completed the admissions application yet, because the college will hold on to your FAFSA data until you've been admitted, and then they will begin to work on your financial aid offer. To determine whether a student is dependent or independent for FAFSA purposes, he'll be asked to consider these questions. Will you be 24 or older by January 1st of the school year for which you're applying for financial aid? Are you married or separated but not divorced? Will you be working on a graduate degree? Do you have children or other dependents other than your children or a spouse who receive more than half of their support from you? Are you currently serving on active duty in the US Armed Forces for purposes other than training? Are you a veteran of the US Armed Forces? At any time since you turned 13, were both of your parents deceased? Were you in foster care or were you a ward or a dependent of the court? Are you an emancipated minor or are you in legal guardianship as determined by a court? And remember that legal custody is not always considered legal guardianship. And the last question reads, are you an unaccompanied youth who's homeless or are you self-supporting and at risk of being homeless? Now, if you can answer yes to just one of these questions and provide a legal document supporting your claim, then you're considered an independent student and you will not be required to provide information about your parents. Now, if you are living with grandparents or other relatives or friends who are not your legal guardians and they have not legally adopted you, you still must provide information about your biological parents. Remember that these people that you are living with that have not adopted you or are not your legal guardians should never provide their information on your FAFSA. For purposes of the FAFSA, you're not considered an independent student simply because you file your own taxes or you live alone and support yourself. However, if you are in a unique situation, you can always contact your financial aid office to file an appeal. They'll work with you independently if you have a special circumstance. And then the most commonly asked question that we receive is, which parent should I list on my FAFSA? The parent or parents that you've lived with the longest in the 12 months prior should be listed on your FAFSA. So if you live with both of your biological parents, that's easy, you're gonna list both of them. But if the parent you lived with the longest in the past 12 months is either separated, divorced, or was never married, you should list only that biological parent on your FAFSA. Um, now, if that parent is remarried, you must also include information about your step parent because federal student aid wants to know the financial standing of the household that the student has lived in the longest in the 12 months prior to the date that the FAFSA was submitted. If you're identified as a dependent student, but your parents refuse to provide their information on your FAFSA, you can submit it, but I'll encourage you to contact the financial aid office to let them know about your situation, because if you don't, you're only going to be offered 
unsubsidized student loans, you won't be considered for any of the free money. Remember that the FAFSA is just a vehicle to gather your information and provide it to your college financial aid offices. And they are the ones that are going to make your financial aid offer. So don't skip this important step. To expedite the processing of your federal student aid, the um, student and parents should use the IRS data retrieval tool to provide income information if they filed a 2020 income tax return. Using this tool is gonna to greatly diminish your chances of being selected for verification on the college campus. Now, if you're having trouble using the tool, you can always call me on Leela's FAFSA helpline. I have some tips for you. But always make sure you're going back into your FSA ID and making sure everything is correct and matches what is in the demographic section. Once you are directed to the IRS portal, grab your 2020 income tax return and enter your name and address exactly as it's printed on that return. Even if your name's misspelled or you've moved since you filed, it's very sensitive. They wanna know that the person who filed that return is the person who's in that IRS site. Then, after you submit your return, your FAFSA, you're going to automatically receive this FAFSA confirmation page. It'll tell you the next steps that you need to take to complete the financial aid process. You'll see a list of the schools that are going to receive your FAFSA data. You will find out what your expected estimated family contribution is going to be. And remember, if you see your financial aid estimates listed on your confirmation page, that's exactly what they are. They're a recommendation to each college financial aid office as to what you might be eligible to receive. Your offer is gonna come directly from the college. Once your FAFSA is fully processed, then it's gonna be shared with the colleges that you've listed in your FAFSA. Once the colleges receive it, usually takes three to five days, um, they will begin to identify any aid that you might be eligible to receive. Now, if you wanna make a change to your FAFSA, once it's been um, submitted, you can always log back into fafsa.gov, make your changes, but remember to sign and submit every time you do so. And if your family's financial situation has changed since 2020, say you there's been a layoff in the family, um, some loss of wages, reduction in work hours, or some unexpected medical expenses, contact your financial aid counselor because they have the ability to adjust your aid by using their own professional judgment. They're there to help you, so don't be shy about contacting them because they're trying to determine your net price. And that's gonna be done by subtracting any grants and scholarships that you might be eligible for from your cost of attendance on their campuses. The net price is your responsibility to pay either in cash or by accepting student loans to pay that balance. Remember that the student will receive a separate financial aid offer from each of the colleges that are listed on the FAFSA. Um, they should line item their cost of attendance, any grants, scholarships, work study, and student loans that they can offer you. Make sure that you're reading through each of them carefully and also responding to any requests for additional information. Once you determine which college you're going to, you want to accept your financial aid in this order. The gift aid, which are scholarships and grants, because that does not have to be repaid. Federal work study next, because you've earned that money and you don't have to pay it back. And then student loans, because that's the borrowed money and you have to repay it with interest. 
Scholarships are gifts that you don't have to be that don't have to be repaid. So make sure that <clears throat> you are searching for those. And there are thousands of them. And I know your counselor has a great um, number of scholarships that she shares with you um, regularly. They're offered by schools, your parents' employers, private and nonprofit organizations, or religious groups. Some are merit-based. Some are based on financial need. They could cover the entire cost of your tuition or be a one-time award. Either way, they're worth applying for because winning them is going to reduce the cost of your education, which bottom line means reducing the cost of uh, the balance of your student loan debt. This year, Lila offers a $1,000 FAFSA completion scholarship for seniors attending a Louisiana high school and a $1,000 Choose Louisiana scholarship for students attending a college in the state of Louisiana. You can find the details and the applications for both of those at leela.org. Now for students or parents who need additional help paying for college after accepting all scholarships, grants, federal and state aid, Leela does administer a nonprofit education loan program called Leela Choice. It's just for Louisiana residents, and you can find out more about it at leelachoice.org. And remember, you must submit a FAFSA every year that you're in college to continue receiving financial aid. I know this is a lot of information, so if you would like a copy of Leela's FAFSA completion guide for the class of 2022, it's free for all Louisiana high school seniors. And you can email me directly at carmichael at leela.org. We're always available to help you with your FAFSA or to answer any financial aid questions that you might have. So be sure that you're jotting down Leela's FAFSA helpline and my email address. I'm looking forward to working with you to help you through this process. So don't hesitate to contact me.